Okay, so welcome to the stream this evening, and uh, it's just a quick stream for us to spend some time with you and then, you know, have some chit chats on the various issues that we need to look out for and position ourselves in when it comes to dealing with financial reporting, 9 a.m. tomorrow, corporate reporting, 2 p.m. also tomorrow. So it's going to be a Q&A session. So uh, if you have any specific questions that you would want me to talk about, share my thought on, very specifically, you hit me with it. You raise your hand, I bring you up. Those of you are with us, with me on Zoom. Then if you are watching on Facebook or on YouTube also, you can put it in the comment section or the chat box. Any questions that you have for me, as much as possible, be specific with a question so that I can go straight, bam, 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 because really we are just going to share our thoughts on the principles. I'm going to be also having time to go through some of the principles when it comes to consolidated financial statements. Then we're going to also have some time to go through a couple of the accounting standards that we need to take into consideration in level two as well as in the level three exclusive. So I'm hoping that it's going to be really an intense session that will prepare you to go in there and uh, pass the examination. Because in the exam hall, all you are doing is applying principles based on the various things that you have studied. So understanding the accounting standards and being able to state the various principles in respect of the standards will play a key role for you to be able to ultimately pass the examination. So any specific questions, you raise your hand, I bring you up. Those of you who are with me here on Zoom, then those who are joining us on YouTube, you can also uh, put it in the comment or the chat box for me because I'm going to be answering all your questions for you. All right, uh, so Nathan, let's get excited about it. What you got for me? Okay, Ishra, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Please, I want you to explain uh, the transfer of revolution gain into the revolution surplus in the equity. I want you to touch on it briefly for me to get some take in there. Okay. okay. So I have a figure here. Maybe you made a gain of uh, 2000 Okay, so then give, later me, give me a sec. Give me a sec. Let me pull up my slide on that quickly. Let me just pull okay, my, okay. my slide. Okay, so let's go. So you said you have a revelation surplus of what? Yes, go. So you made a revelation gain of 2000 Right. Then you have... Uh, the task rate to be 30 percent so you calculate deferred task li liability mm -hmm. then later on you made a, a revaluation loss of thousand so i want to see how you do the transfer to revaluation surplus i don't understand if only you can transfer like we you want to we make already a have a revaluation surplus how do we make another transfer to revaluation surplus again no, I mean revaluation gain. I said that you have a revaluation gain of uh, 2000 Then it, there is a deferred task uh, liability on it. Then you make a revaluation loss again. So okay. how will you do the transfer? I still don't get the context of your question. When you say the transfer, what kind of transfer? Are you talking about how do you treat the revaluation loss? or transfer from revaluation surplus to retain earnings. What are you asking? Because I still don't yeah, know the context uh, of the question. Yeah, revaluation gain to uh, revaluation surplus. That's what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> revaluation gain and revaluation surplus are the same thing. No? What are you asking? <laughs> I don't know what you want to ask. I still don't get you. I don't know why. <laughs> You said oh. the company made a gain of 2000 There's a deferred tax of 30%. If they, we have to calculate deferred tax on the revaluation gain, that deferred tax must be recognized in the OCI on the revaluation surplus. Uh -huh. So if you are going to make the transfer to the return, and how are you going to go about it? If, we are, if the entity makes transfer from revaluation surplus to retain earnings, then we have to be, you need to have the remaining economic useful life. Because the transfer 
the annual transfer is going to be the revaluation surplus divided by the remaining economic useful life. Oh, okay. okay. So that once you do the calculation, then you can debit the revaluation surplus with the amount you are going to get. Then you will credit the, um, how do we call it? The retained earnings with that amount of the transfer. Then the deferred tax you are going to be calculating, it will be negated in the OCI, then also subtracted from the revaluation surplus on the face of the statement of financial position for that year ended under review. So if okay, so are you going? To, uh -huh, go. Are you going to take the transfer of the two thousand before taking the task from it, or you take the task from it before you do the transfer of the remaining figure? That's the one that the I want to get. Transfer will be on the absolute surplus that we had. Oh, okay, because, okay. Because, thank you. Because that is what will bring about the excess depreciation. So it is the okay. whole surplus that we will do that use for the transfer in the working that we do. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Okay, so any other questions for me? Specifically, bam, 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 you hit me in the head, you raise your hand, I bring you up. Those of you are with me on Zoom. And then, uh, or you put it in the chat for me still if you're on Zoom. And then those of you watching us online on YouTube, Facebook, you can put it in the comments or the chat for me. I'm going to be trying to pull up a couple of the questions also from there and then answer them as much as possible in that case. So any questions for me, you raise your hand, I bring you up and then we go in that case. Uh, seeing some comments coming from here, uh, I said, uh, hello, hi, Sherinda. Mr. Clement said, CR Moro, we pray for victory. Definitely, we do. Your voice is down. I hope it is up now because Isaac Obiara said, hi, Shira, thanks for your good, um, what? Thanks for your good support to all students all over the world. I'm in Uganda, and I use a lot of your lectures. That's great to hear, Isaac Obira. And I said Obira. What kind of school did I even attend at this point? Okay, so that's also another comment there. Let's see if I have something else coming up for me. Excellent work in Shira. That is from Magona Jonah. Okay, Magona, thank you. Any questions for me, please, quickly, before I get into my group? Okay, because I want to see if I can spend some time to talk about some few things, talk about some standards, talk about some consolidation and all that. So specific questions for me. Godwin Tay said hi. Hello, Godwin. Thanks for joining us on the stream. Okay, so I think I have a hand up on Zoom. Let me go and bring that up. Yes, Christina. Yes, Christina. Please, uh, I want to ask uh, about a uh, revaluation surplus. Mm -hmm. Where the uh, in consolidate, uh, consolidated financial statement, where the parent is preparing using the cost model and the subsidiary is using the revaluation model. And the subsidiary has a revaluation surplus. So the conversion, if you could throw some light on it, I'll be glad. So let me understand what you're trying to say. So How to convert from the revaluation. So let me understand what you're trying to say here. You are saying that um, su subsidiary, uh, um, whatever the heck, is using cost model for the calculation for the treatment of uh non care no the, sub, the 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 parent the parent is using cost model mm -hmm. and then the subsidiary is using and the, the subsidiary is using the revaluation okay oh god creation surplus of say fifty thousand okay So and uh, maybe the asset value is 
<laughs> okay, relax. Don't you forget the figures in a moment. W what are you trying to ask? Forget the values in a moment. What I want to ask is that mm -hmm. how how to convert the revaluation surplus to agree with the cost model of the parents so that we can do the consolidation. Okay, okay. If I get you right, I think I understand. You know, in our mock, we had a similar question, but I'm still not okay with the treatment. So I want some clarity on that one. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, so let me explain what's happening. Now, um, as you said, on consolidation, we have to bring the financial statements of the subsidiary aligned to the financial statements of the parent entity. So what you are asking is, for instance, the revaluation surplus on the face of the statement of financial position of the subsidiary is, say, 50000 How do we do that? Now, the first thing is they are not supposed to have revalued. Yeah. The first thing is they are not supposed to have revalued the assets. So if you remember the context of the question we solved, we changed the calculation and uh, reversed the calculation that they have done. So what is going to be happening is that whatever revaluation surplus that the subsidiary had already recognized on the face of their financial statements, on consolidation purposes, we cannot benefit in that. That is why, if you remember, in the workflow, we did not touch that revaluation surplus. The reason is that the parent entity is using cost model. So the consolidated financial statement will be prepared on a cost model basis. So when we're preparing the net asset schedule, mm -hmm. you realize that we didn't bring in the revaluation surplus effect. The reason is because on consolidation, we are going to be refer reversing the accounting treatment that has been done. And so we have to restate the assets at its original amount and then restate the amounts that they have to recognize in respect of the depreciation for the period under review. So for consolidation purposes, their revaluation surplus that they have is not going to be affecting the consolidated financial statement because they are not in the first place supposed to have done that. Does that make sense? So that is why in the question we saw... Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Check your network, uh, Christina, and then probably you can come back for us because I think your network is okay. it's messing you up. So I'm finding it difficult to actually hear you. So maybe check your network and then you can come back. I said, My friends, talking. Good evening. Um, please, the format for computation. I said, please. I said, good evening, Nishira. Please, format for goodwill computation in stage acquisition. I don't understand what you're saying, but I think I understand what you're saying. In other words, my brain is trying to get what, what the heck you are trying to say. So let me try to see if this is what you are saying. So probably this is what you are saying, that we acquired, say, 40% of the business maybe two years ago. It was in control, so we treated it in accordance with IAS 20, 20, whatever the heck, 28, investment in associate. Then, after that, we acquired another 30%. So now, together, it becomes 70%, and we have obtained control over the company. So, if this is what you are asking, Emmanuel, that means at now that we have obtained control, how do we calculate goodwill? It's very simple. We bring fair value of consideration transferred. For the additional 30% that we bought, okay, in my example here, okay, for the additional 30% that we bought, you bring that up. Then you bring fair value of the previous investment we were having, okay, the previous equity investment. The 40% the that you bought two years ago, the fair value as at the date that you obtain the control, it will be given to you in the question. So you bring that up 40%. I 
Are you following the picture? Because now you obtain control. Now, so because you asked the question in terms of goodwill, I will attach it in goodwill, but expand the discussion a little bit. So the fair value of consideration you paid for, for the extra percentage that you got control will come. Then number two, the fair value of the previous equity investment we're having will come. Then we bring fair value of whatever the heck, our NCI, right? Then it follows through that, 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 that that's all. So that's how we calculate goodwill in the stage acquisition environment. But this is the deal. Any fair value gain or loss from the previous investment must be recognized in the P&L account if we are doing consolidated P&L or in the group retained earnings if we are doing consolidated profit or loss. What do I mean by that? Let's say the 40% that we bought two years ago, at the date that we obtain control, the fair value is whatever the heck, let's say 10,000. But the current value at the date that we obtain control is 11,000. That means there is a fair value loss of 1,000. That fair value loss, if we are doing consolidated P&L, it will come in the consolidated P&L as an expenses. The reason is that now that you have obtained control, you have to de-recognize the previous investment on the face of the financial statement. So the de-recognition will create either a fair value gain or a fair value loss that must be recognized in the consolidated financial statement. So that is the addition to the question that you ask. But for the purpose of for goodwill, you have to bring the fair value you paid to get the control for the extra, then the fair value of the previous investment as at the date that you obtain the control, then the natural thing follow in what you know about already. So that's how you deal with calculation of goodwill in the stage acquisition environment. So Emmanuel, let me know if that was what you were asking and what you wanted to do. Please, financial reporting student, don't bring your brain here. This is beyond your pay grade, okay? So if you are doing financial reporting, don't think about it. Don't say, oh, you, should, uh, you didn't teach us this. Mm -mm. It's above your pay grade. So if you are doing financial reporting, please, don't think about this one. It's strictly for the corporate reporting students so that you don't get your heart coofed in at this point when I need your heart to be calming. So, Emmanuel, let me know if that is okay for you. What else do we have? Yes, Ernestina. Ernestina. Sure. Yes, ma. Um, I'm okay now. I'm okay. Oh, okay. Okay. But, Ernestina, sure, let's divide the class with the corporate reporting, so they are buying pressure for us. <laughs> Right now, I'm oh, I'm slipping my notes. I don't know what they are talking about. <laughs> relax, relax. <laughs> Th there is just a little excess in them. So w when he asks any question that doesn't relate to FR, I will tell you so that you relax. Okay? So that was why I gave oh, the clarity okay. on this one. So relax. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, yes, George, what you got? Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. So my question borders largely on ratios. However, I have some consolidation aspects in it as well. Let's go. So the question was okay, so this is how the question goes. Um it's a particular entity with two years resource, 2014 and 2013. However, um in the current year during uh, the cost of the current year, acquisition was made. So they brought in a new um, subsidiary. And for that matter, the results in the current year compared to the previous year in a way varies a bit. Right. So my question has to do with um, when you are looking at the impact on the current year's financial resource, especially with the goodwill and then the uh, net asset, oh, 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 uh, how does it? impact the current year when you are computing ratios like return on capital employee whereby you would need the total assets and then the current liabilities okay I, I don't know if my question is clear but what i want to say is that 
would that good go in any way impact the ratio computation with that um, net asset addition coming into the uh, picture impact the ratio computation in, in any way? Okay. Uh, I think that's uh, what I, I, I want to say. Sorry. Now, a, a ratio question of that sort must be analyzed and looked at from two perspectives, and it's a very tough ratio question. So let me explain what's happening here for those of you who didn't hear the question well. So we have two years, say 20x5, and another year 20x4. Now the 20x5 is the current year. And in the current year, at the beginning of the current year, they acquired a subsidiary. So what then it means is that when you take the 20x5 information, both the PNL and the statement of financial position, it is actually on a consolidated level. Okay, so it's a consolidated level in the current year, but in the previous year, they were just a single company. So how do you approach a question like this? Now, the previous year's ratio will be calculated the way it has to be, but you know that the only way we can analyze the performance of the company is we need to bring the results to an equal ground. So there are two sets of ratios that you have to calculate. You have to calculate the ratio as given on the consolidated level for the 20x5. Then you have to also look at the results of the business they acquired out of the 20x5 results so that you get the results of 20x5 without the impact of the business that they acquired. And that is how you're going to do the analysis. So that you look at, okay, 20x5, without a business they acquired, this is the result. When we compare it to 20x4, this is how it is. However, if we look at the impact of the subsidiary, then this is how it is now. So we can then conclude that the subsidiary that was acquired is actually a profitable subsidiary or not. You bad? Another flip side is disposal. That can occur. Maybe in 20x4, we were a whole company. In 20x5, they sold a division of the business. And so, in order to bring the results equally and analyze, the 20x4 results would have to be adjusted by removing the, the entity that was sold in 20x5 from the 20x4 results so that we can analyze to conclude whether the division has sold a profitable unit or not. So that's how you look at it. You calculate the ratio in its original state as given to you. Then you have to also calculate another ratio by removing the impact of the acquisition from the current year results as you ask, then you do your analysis, which means you're going to be doing your analysis with reference to three different ratios. The ratio of last year, you are comparing that to the ratio of this year, including the business they acquired, and then this year's ratio, excluding the business they acquired. That is how you deal with such questions when it comes to ratio analysis. So, George, let me know if that makes sense to you here. Okay, that's coming up. I said then, treatment of tax in single entity. Lord, yeah, when you say treatment of tax in single entity account, I said then, in single entry account, I don't understand that though. Please be specific so that I don't have to be thinking a lot. Please. Give me some specific thing. Please. Give me something specific, please. Something specific, please. Uh yes, George, please come up. Yes. Okay, so I think I get a general approach, but let me be a bit specific on how the question goes. Go. So um like you were explaining the result of the uh, current year both the current year and then the previous year has been given right and then the result of the acquiry the subsidy which was applied were also given okay and then the question was like um first of all it, they, they were actually in three folds first of all 
calculating the ratio of the current year considering the impact of the subsidiary. Okay. And then the other aspect has to do with the, um, calculating the same equivalent ratio without the impact of the uh, subsidiary. Uh, meanwhile, the previous year time ratios have already been given as per the question. So specifically, my question has to do with um, with the good rule because in the current year, which is the uh, 2014, we see good rule as part of the financial statement of the period just because of the uh, acquisition. Yes. And then um, the net asset amount, the value for the net asset that was acquired was also given in the question. So what I want to know is that, you know, when I was calculating um, the ratios, I got two of them wrong, which has to do with the return on capital employee and the net asset turnover. You know, the aspect of questions, I supposed to use the total asset minus the current liability as my capital employee formula. But because the good rule, because of the good rule impact, I'm not getting something right. So the question I'm asking is whether the impact, um, whether the impact, whether the acquisition, as in the subject, joining the parent now has impact on the total asset computation. Yeah, you just mentioned. Let me come again. You just mentioned that you so, are doing calculation for uh, the ratios without the subsidiary's influence and with the subsidiary's influence. So if we are working without the subsidiary's okay. influence, then certainly the goodwill will not be part because you have to remove the subsidiary's influence okay. and then goodwill will not be part. But if you are looking at the subsidiary's influence, okay. then the goodwill will be part because it is now on a consolidation level. So goodwill will be incorporated in the financial statements. Okay, so that one is uh, correct for me. It's okay for me. What about the, the 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 amount invested in the subsidiary? Because it's only when you are doing consolidation, you look at the net net acquired, whereby you consider so many things. So the two things was where was actually what the uh, thing that was the the amount that was paid to the subsidiary will actually come in our analysis, not in our calculation. Okay. I don't know. Come up because I think I don't know why your networks are messing you guys up this night. Uh, yeah, you were saying something. Please go. Let's see. Yes. Yes. So what I'm saying is that I was wondering whether the uh, the the purchase or the acquisition made could have in, in, in impact on the retaining earnings of the period. For the current year period in any way no you know the payment that because was, payment does is doesn't come from retaining earnings. it depends on the way they finance it so really what's going to be happening is that the fair value of consideration transferred is not going to be having any impact on our calculation instead it's going to come in the calculation aspect and so we need to find out how did they finance it so that in case we calculate the quick ratio or the current ratio and we find out that oh the current ratio is worsening from year on year then probably or the company is having some bank overdraft in the current year and they were not having in the previous year or their share capital has gone up in the current year from the previous year then we may conclude that the share capital going up may be because part of the acquisition was financed through share exchange or if they are having a worsening liquidity position, then we could say that they used the cash available to finance part of the acquisition of the company. So the money paid for the acquisition will come in our analysis when we are interpreting the ratios. Does that make sense? Okay, sir. I, I, I get you. Lastly, lastly, lastly on the same question. So um, let me a bit precise here. So if you look at the question, state that um, purchase the trading assets and operations of so and so for fifty million dollars, and on the and on the same date, issued additional ten percent loan notes to finance the purchase. So this was the point I was wondering whether the loan note coming into the equation in any way will affect the gearing of the parents in the current year or not. 
But the end of the day, it affects the total capital employed as well. Yes, because if I don't know whether you get a picture now. Yes, so if you are calculating the uh, ratio, the general ratio on the consolidation level, that is including the impact of the acquisition, then that will be included. But if you are calculating the general ratio without the acquisition of the subsidiary, then that will not be included in the general ratio. What about the interest company? Because the loan was pushed with a 10% coupon. Is there any way it can affect? Because I was thinking um, it could, the interest ought to be calculated per annum. And so, here's the case that it was applied three months to the end of the um, period. So Whether it's going the, to be incorporated into the account or not. So this is the issue. The principle is this. When we are giving financial statement for two years, and in the current year there is any acquisition, we have to do ratios in three different ranges. The previous year calculation will be done. The current year calculation will be done in twofold. You will do the current year calculation okay. inclusive of the subsidiary that was acquired. So everything about the subsidiary that was acquired, you just take the results as given and work your way, work your way out. But then you have to also calculate another set of ratio excluding the impact of the acquisition. So if you are calculating that second category of ratio, excluding the impact of the, of the acquisition, that means any finance cost, like you are saying, would have been included in the finance cost, and that will come in if we are calculating the interest cover ratio in that particular case. Because in any case, you are using profit before interest and tax. So the finance cost will not even come into the picture. Uh, in the discussion, but it is when you are calculating the interest cover ratio that probably the finance cost would have to come in. So the principle is this, in the current year, as per what you are saying, you calculate the ratios inclusive of the subsidiary as it is given, no adjustment, just do the workings like that. Then you calculate another ratio excluding any impact that the subsidiary brought on the financial statement. So that we calculate the ratios assuming they were never acquired. So any impact of them on the financial statement, both P&L and position will be taken out. They will calculate the ratio for the business in that case. That is the principle about how you deal with such issues. Does that make sense? Okay, sir, thank you very much. I think I'll work through and then get Okay. It makes sense. It makes sense. I'll work, I'll work. If I don't get the just right, I'll, I'll test you privately. All right. Yes, Evelyn. Thank you, Nisha. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Nisha, my question is um, on revenue uh, over time. In, I think you mentioned that when you calculate the profit, the overall profit of uh, when there is a, a revenue, a contract over time, the first step you calculate the overall profit okay. before mm -hmm. you go ahead with it, and then you mentioned that if it uh, the, it ends in a loss, you treat it as a one loss um, contract. Uh, one loss contract. <laughs> yes, go ahead. And you apply IAS uh, thirty seven. Right. So um, I know that IAS 37, most of them you um, discount and then uh, going forward, you unwind. Like you discount, you bring it to the present value if it is for an asset or something, and then you unwind. So how do you treat this? No, yeah, thing? you don't do any unwinding. You just recognize it as, pro you, make it, you make provision for it in the financial statement. You don't discount anything here. So... It's just going to be recognized in the PNL account as provision and on the face of the statement of financial position as provision. That's all. No discounting, no unwinding. Do you understand? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> The way she's responding, mm, is like, <laughs> 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 <la
Or she more say, hmm, what the matter and she? That's the idea. Because if it is a loss, it's a loss. You don't discount on wine. That loss is going to be recognized in the PL account. Because if it is profit, we don't discount and allocate the profit. Do we? We don't. So when we say account for it in accordance with IAS 37, it's because IAS 37 states that an entity can make provision for losses arising from onerous contracts. Not IAS 37 as discounting and doing or winding. That's the principle about that. That's the principle about that. Okay. Yes, Nathan, what you got? Okay, sure. Please, you stay with me for some time because I have some two questions I want to ask. Okay. Okay. The first one is about uh, it's about all the questions about consolidation, and when we have operating list or something to do with investment property, uh, we know that we need to revert the transaction and treat the assets as per IAS system. So in that, we need to reverse. If we have treated any fair value gain or loss, we need to reverse it. So first, I want to know, when you have the, you calculate the depreciation, how are we going to treat that? Depreciation about on what? I mean, when you have operating lease between maybe the subsidiary and the parent, and you are reversing the transaction, so you reverse the, if there is any fair value loss or, or gain, you reverse it. Relax, relax, then you relax, the... relax, relax, relax. I don't understand anything you're saying. When you say there is a okay, I'm saying... between parents, what do you mean? I don't understand. So be specific. I'm, I'm trying to say that maybe a parent transfer an asset to a subsidiary or the other way around. Mm -hmm. And the asset transfer, they are treating it like operating lease or through fair value, like for capital appreciation or rentals. Okay. Please, are you, are you getting? Uh -huh. And in that case, how are we going to treat it? And I'm seeing that. Relax, relax. relax I know relax, that you have to Relax, do. relax, relax. If it is an investment property, then the asset is not them, the yes. The asset will still be accounted for in the books of whoever is doing the transfer. So the entity receiving the asset or using the asset will not recognize the asset in their books. So I don't know what principle you are applying here. Because if it is an operating lease like you are saying, or an investment property like you are saying, the entity who owns the asset will still be accounting for the asset in accordance with IAS 40. So there is no excess depreciation to be calculated anyway. Ah, uh, okay. But per what I saw in uh, under IS forty is that anytime that a parent is transferring a, an asset to a subsidiary and they are treating it, they are carrying the assets at fair value. You need to reverse any uh, gain or loss made on that listen, and carry listen, the asset listen, listen 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 what you are just saying is different from what you talked about you are saying that if they sold the asset that is where the uh, provision for profit or loss it has to be adjusted for in the books of the two entities but if it is just leasing the assets to them then it will still be accounted for as or if they are still accounting for it as an investment property, then it will still in, be in the books of the entity who is giving the asset out to the other entity. So <laughs> which fair value adjustment that has to be done? Because they are just renting it to them and receiving annual rentals. If they sold the asset, that is where adjustment has to come in. Because if the other entity is not recognizing the asset, then there is no need to do any adjustment in the financial statement. So I don't know what you are seeing and what you are saying because what you are seeing doesn't click to me. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe you are not getting what I'm trying to say, but I'll just take it like that. <laughs> then... <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because I saw, I saw a first question that uh, there is something like investment 
pro property or something. You see, and the parent gives out listen, asset. Listen, listen. Take time, go back and look at the details well. But take what I'm telling you. We do those adjustments, fair value adjustment, pre uh, pro uh, provision for unrealized profits, gain, and all that, and adjustment for depreciation if there is sale. One entity sold the asset to the other. That is where we have to make the adjustment. But if they are just leasing the asset to them, what depreciation adjustment do we have to do again? Because they are, it's an operating lease. It's been accounted for as an investment property. And if we, the investment property, the user of the asset doesn't recognize the asset in their books, we, the people who own it, will apply IAS 40 either at the cost model or the fair value model. So make sure you check what you are checking well so that you get the right thing so you don't, you know, mess things up at the end of the day. So you can go to the other question. Okay. Uh, my second question have to do with uh, provision for unrealized profits. Right. Um, when the parents sold to a subsidiary with a, a markup, maybe let's say 20%, mm -hmm. and the same subsidiary to is selling to an associate mm -hmm. with a different markup, please, how are we going to treat that? Are we going to do the, the provision using the different markup or we have a way of treating it? Okay. If, you know, I'm trying to get the context of your question because it's not specific to me. If I get what you're I'm saying, saying that you are saying that a parent a has sold to subsidiary at a certain markup. Yes. A subsidiary yes. has sold to an associate at a certain markup. And at yes. the end of the year, they all have some of the goods in stock. Then you are yes, asking, please. do we use different markup? Why would you use different markup if not the markup at which they sold the goods to the other party? Because mm -hmm. the provision for realized profit, if parent sold to associate, uh, subsidiary at whatever rate, 20% margin, and they have some of the goods in stock, we just apply that and calculate the provision for realized profit. If subsidiary is selling to somebody at whatever markup or whatever margin, we just apply that rate. So if you're asking, do we use a different markup? No. It is okay. the markup at which they are selling to them that we apply. So if it is the if the question is about markup, we can't use any other markup apart from the markup at which the seller sells to the other entity. Okay. Maybe the, the market scheme is deceiving me. <laughs> if I do use the question. All right. Yes, Samuel. Please make sure you give me <coughs> specific questions and make your questions very clear so that we don't struggle. Yes, Samuel, let's go. It, it, it's, before I start, it's not, it's, the question is not clear. <laughs> <laughs> mine is on lease okay you no know, uh, in, in preparing the amortization schedule right when it, we have the advance and the uh arrears accrual right. direct the arrears one you know in the first year in, in terms of the advance in the first year what i've been noticed in the first year, they will not deduct the the initial payment, the loan payment. Relax, then relax, the second relax, year. Relax, 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 relax. Take it easy. It's about principle. Understand it. When we are calculating the lease obligation, if payment is made in advance, the assumption is that once you get your present value of minimum lease obligation, you would deduct the first payment that was made. So that the lease obligation that you will start with in the schedule, you've already deducted the first payment. That is why in that first year, normally you wouldn't see them deducting payment again. But if you decide to work with the total present value of 
uh, lease obligation, what, which you calculated without deducting the first payment, then the flow will go normally. So it is not about what you see them doing. It's about understanding the principle behind it. Did you get that? I, I, I get it. Okay. <laughs> so on the other hand, Akua, you go. Uh, that 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 rest that one too. How would it go? No payment in arrears. Arrears is at the end of the year. So definitely to go in that normal flow, whatever present value of minimum lease obligation we get, it will just come and then we'll do our workings. In that particular case, the difference between the two is just the way the schedule is going to be structured. So in the arrears, you won't see what you said you have been seeing. Because it's yes. going in the normal flow. But in advance, that is where sometimes, because they have already paid the first one, they will deduct it from the present value of the minimum lease obligation. Then they will just start with the normal figure and then go away in that particular case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does okay. that make sense? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, right. So, uh, in your second one, uh, this one, I just want to uh, cast my mind back. In, uh, in university time, we have a formula when you want, when you want to calculate the sum of. Uh, yeah, the gifts. No, uh, the present, the present value. Okay. Uh huh. We we had a formula rather than doing it maybe year one, year two, year three, year four then you get that amount but uh, i'm trying to record that formula i'm not getting i don't know if you can help are you talking about the annuity formula yeah that's the annuity formula probably you're talking about if a payment is made the same payment in, is made over a given number of years then yes you have to use the annuity formula give me a sec let's see if i can pull that up It's some beautiful formula B. Uh, no, this is, so this is the formula. This is the annuity formula. So okay. if the same payment is made year on year, then you are better off using the annuity formula. But you have to be careful that in the final year, you are using the present value for whatever amount that is gonna be coming generally in that particular case. And during the mock discussion, we solved the question under lease, and you saw the way we played this out. I don't know if you were, you you were part of that session or watched that video, but that's the idea about that. Okay, 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 okay. Isha, thank you. All right. What else we got? I'm seeing some comments coming in. Let's see if we can pick some comments in the chat. Please, can you briefly explain how to interpret, uh, what cash flow? ratios okay so this is for copy reporting students uh, only okay let's see if i can get my slide on that and probably share that with you uh if i can give me a sec let me see if i can pull that up uh july 2023 what the heck do i have that will be in copy reporting no copy reporting sessions give me a sec let's see if i can pull it up if not, because it's just, uh, I wouldn't want to write, just want to show you then. I will just talk through it for you. Oh, Shira, Shira and Kanyane, Sewa Boy, Name, who question, no, and dear, we my time. Give me a sec. If I don't see this, oh my goodness. Should it be in the master class? I don't think so. Okay, let me just check a final slide. If I don't get it, because it's just a one slide page that I think I should have. Okay, I don't have a slide, but I think after the class, I'll check and show you. So I'll just talk to you about it on how 
you need to look at it. Let me just go back to my November slide. Uh, what am I doing? CR here. Oh. So this is what you do when you're interpreting the ratios, eh, the cash flow statement. Number one, you need to look at whatever the heck is coming up. So the net cash uh, flows from, you know, operating, financing, investing, you need to talk about them. Why is it like that? So they are the net, you approach them. So if your uh, investing net cash flow from investing activity is negative, what does it tell us? It tells us that during the year, the entity made a lot of investment in the acquisition of property, plants, and equipment or equity investment. And hence, there will be increase in future economic benefit flowing to the entity in the future. But if the investing activity was positive, what does that mean? It means during the year, they liquidated a lot of their assets, a lot of their equity investment, possibly. And when that happens, it could indicate that probably they are surplus assets that the entity disposed of during the year, or maybe they disposed of some profitable assets during the year, which may indicate that there may be reduction in future economic benefit because of the fact that they've sold a lot of their assets in the current year. Then your financing activity, if it is positive, what does that mean? It means there is more money coming into the business, either from the issue of shares, and that will be specific on the face of the cash flow, or issue of loan notes. If it is negative, probably because the entity paid some dividend during the year, or the entity repaid some loan notes during the year, which means the jerry ratio of the company is going to reduce. Are you getting the idea? So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. The second thing is like what I, I, I mentioned a moment ago. You then have to touch on the individual elements, okay, like working capital in the operating activities, then various assets and liability, various assets that were acquired or disposed of in the investing activities. Then the issues about any loans or shares that has been issued or repurchased during the year individually. Then as you are doing your analysis, like I just said, you must talk about the impact of the investing activities and the financing activity on the jeering level and the financial risks of the entity. You must talk about that. So we start with the net result. What does it tell us in general terms? Then you narrow down to the individual items, working capital management, asset that has been acquired or disposed of, uh, loans that have been issued or uh, repaid during the year. Then what is the impact of that on the GRN level of the entity? These are some of the things that we will talk about when analyzing the cash flow statement generally in that particular case. So that's what you talk about. That's what you talk about generally. And there are other issues that we can raise concern on, on the future of the entity, like I told you about, whether the entity is going to be having some future economic benefit flowing to it or not flowing to it because of what is happening under the investing activity. Please, this is for corporate reporting students, financial reporting students. This is not your field. This is above your pay grade. So, thou shall not think about it. All right? So, Clement, that's the idea about that. After the class, I'm going to check. Uh, there is, I have a list of some of the things that you need to talk about. But generally, these are some of the things here. I have a list of some of the things you need to talk about. After the class, I'll quickly check it and then... Uh, put it on the page for you so that you can, you know, get it. But generally, that is what you have to talk about. The net result, then talk about the individual item. What does it tell us? How will that affect jeering level? How will that affect the future economic benefits of the entity? Can the entity go borrow a lot of money in the future and all that? That's what we need to look out for there. 
Let me know if that is okay. Wisdom said, I almost changed my mind of writing the paper tomorrow until you said it's for corporate. <laughs> Sorry, okay, don't change your mind. Okay, Emmanuel said, sure, I got it. What else do I have? Um, can you please touch on partial and full disposal in preparing uh, consolidated financials? Consolidated financial statement. I don't know what the heck you mean by partial or full disposal because got to be specific on some of the things there in that particular case. But, you know, when we dispose of a company, uh, a subsidiary that we have, it means we no longer own that subsidiary. So what's going to be happening is that we're going to be looking at what is it that we got, you know, proceeds from the disposal from the disposal will be brought there, generally in that particular case, then any goodwill that we have in the books will be brought. Let me bring that a little bit down. The current amount or the fair value of NCI at the date of the disposal will be brought as though it is ours, okay, as though it is ours. Then goodwill is going to be brought. We have to write off the goodwill. Then the net asset of the subsidiary will be brought. And then we can get the gain or loss on the disposal, which is what we recognize in the PL account. Now, because we have disposed of, if it is mid year or pathway through the year that the disposal is occurring, then certainly it means that. In the preparation of the financial statement of the company, we will consolidate up to the date that we lost control of the company. Does that make sense? We consolidate up to the date we lost control of the company. So if uh, the year ended of the company is 31st October and we sold the company on, say, 31st July. Now, if the year end on 31st October, it means it starts from 1st Nov. So from 1st Nov to 31st July, we can consolidate the financial statement of the subsidiary up to that point because after that, we can no longer include their results in our financial statement. Then, in the PL account, whatever gain or loss we got from the disposal will come in the PL account. And then, if we are doing consolidated OCI, whatever gain or loss will also, A, if we are doing consolidated position, Whatever gain or loss will go to the consolidated statement of, will go to the group retained earnings or the consolidated retained earnings. Financial reporting student, please, this is above your pay grade, okay? So don't have heartbeat, okay? Stay. This is for corporate reporting people. It's above your pay grade. So don't think about it. So that is the idea about the disposal in that particular case. Now, if we are selling but we are not losing control, then all we're going to do is to calculate the carrying amount of the subsidiary at the date of the disposal. Then the share that we are selling to them will just come in there. So if, for instance, let's say we own 80% of the company and we are selling 20% of the company, all right? We are selling 20% of the company to the other people. So that now, at the end of the day, we're going to have 60%. Now, 60% means we were still going to be consolidating it, so no problem. However, how do we get the portion that we are transferring out? You're just going to look at the current amount of the subsidiary at the date of the disposal, then we will take 20% of that, and that will be the amount that is transferring to the other owners. And this change happens in the retained earnings. In the retained earnings. If you have my book on copy reporting, I simplified these things very well in the copy reporting book. Okay? Please, FR people, I said this is not your own. Okay? So don't get any ideas into your head. That's why I'm telling you it's not your own. Focus on what you have learned. This above your pay grade. Unless you want to buy yourself some pressure that you don't like. 
Okay, give me a second. Let me pull this up. So if you have my book on copy reporting, like I did this in a very, very sincere manner. Let's see if I can just show you what I'm talking about. But if you have my copy reporting book, whatever book you have should, you know, talk about this change in ownership. I did it in very, very simple manner. So you can see the profile I told you about here. This is the profile generally that we're going to be talking about in this particular case. And there is a question there that explains the way it works. It's very simple. You can use it and understand the principle and you know what is happening in that particular case. So if you have my book on copy reporting, this is very simple. You can do this in 15, 20 minutes and understand the principle very sweet. But that is the idea generally about how we deal with those kind of transfers. Insurer, please, a snapshot on provisions and the unwinding computation. Okay, so provisions, if it happens that we need to take into consideration the time value of money, then we need to calculate the present value of the provision. So if, for instance, it's an environmental cleanup, then we have to discount. Or someone sues the company, okay, and the company has to make the payment a year from now or maybe two, year from two years from now. Or even it is consolidation we are doing. And as part of the fair value of consideration transferred, there is a deferred payment. In any of these circumstances, IS 37 will come to town so that we can calculate the present value of that future payment. And the figure is going to be the present value of the future payment multiplied by the discount factor. N is the number of periods. How long from now are we going to make the payment? R is the cost of capital of the entity, which will be given to us in the question. So once you calculate that present value, that becomes the initial value that you deal with. But you've got to be careful because all the time when we are dealing with provisions, you need to ask yourself, is it an asset-related provision or a non-asset-related provision? So let's use the three scenarios that I have here. If it is environmental cost, then you know that this present value we will calculate will be included in the initial cost of the asset. Number two, if it is a lawsuit against us, then that present value will be recognized in the P&L account because it is not an asset-related provision. Okay, so it will be recognized in the P&L account. If we are doing consolidated financial statements and it is a deferred payment and we are discounting it, then that present value will be part of the fair value of consideration transferred. I hope you see how each of these are applying generally. Then on subsequent measurement, that's where we need to calculate the finance cost or what we call unwinding. Unwinding. And always any unwinding is going to be the present value times the interest rate we used or the cost of capital we used. And the unwinding generally goes to P&L accounts. Whether it was asset-related or non-asset-related, it goes to the P&L account. Because the double entry is we're going to debit profit or loss with the unwinding figure and credit provisions. Which means that on the face of the statement of financial position, the carrying value of the provision will be the present value plus the unwinding or finance cost. So that is how we deal with provisions, present value, and unwinding. IAS 37. But like I told you earlier when, you know, um, Evelyn asked a question, it is not always that we have to discount what we are supposed to do because sometimes the question will be specific, ignore time value of money. Then, although it's a provision, we may not have to discount anything. And in that case, we won't do unwinding. But this is the bailer trap. In that case, the examiner will give us the money at the date of the date, at the date of the transaction, maybe $200. Then at the year ended, the examiner will give us another figure, maybe 220. So it means that the 200 becomes the initial value, the 220 becomes the closing value. 
so that the difference between the 200 and the 220 is the unwinding or finance cost. So in my example here, that 20 will go to the PL account as finance cost or unwinding. So it depends on the context of the question. Either we are giving cost of capital, then we will discount it, or the examiner will say we should ignore time value of money, or he will give us the value at the date of the transaction and the value at the reporting date. Then the difference between that becomes the finance cost that will go to P&L, and the value at the date of the transaction becomes the initial measurement, and the value at the end of the year will be what we recognize on the face of the statement of financial position. Under current liability, if the payment is due in less than 12 months, and a non-current liability if the payment is due in more than 12 months. So that's IAS 37. We're done. Let me know if that makes sense, and then if there are any other questions, you can bring that also up in that case. Treatment of deferred tax and current tax in a single entity account. Issue about current tax and deferred tax depends on the context of the question. Because um, by default, anything about tax will be accounted for in the PL account. So you can prepare your income tax account, bring your opening balance on the current tax. And then the deferred tax also bring your opening balance. Pretend to close the account. Get a balance carried down. Get a balance brought down for both current tax and deferred tax. You balance this account and the balancing figure is going to be the charge for the year. Which will go to the P&L account. So if you are doing statement of profit or loss, then... That's what will go. Then the current tax closing will go under current liability. The deferred tax closing will go to the non-current liability. But you have to be careful because the opening balances for the current tax especially, it could either be on the debit side or the credit side in the trial balance. Whichever side it is on in the trial balance, you bring it into your tax account like that. So if it's on the debit side, bring it on the debit side as the opening balance. That's the current tax. If it's on the credit side, bring it on the credit side as the closing balance. Then in the footnote, we will be giving information about the current tax. We'll be giving information about any deferred tax that must be calculated. But the reason why I said it depends on the context of the question is that deferred tax is actually in two folds if you want to. Deferred tax can arise as a result of, you know, revaluation of assets. And deferred tax can arise, and this is just for corporate reporting students in respect of IFRS to share-based payment. So I'm not talking about that now because the question is in relation to FR. So if there is a revaluation during the year and there is any deferred tax arising from the revaluation, then a portion of the deferred tax must be recognized in the OCI. And any excess is what will come in the PL account. So that is why I said it depends on the structure of the question. If everything is quiet, no excesses, then whatever the movement in the deferred tax will be recognized in the PL account. But if the examiner says movement in deferred tax should be recognized in the OCI, then you don't put these two in the same account. You have to work for the current tax separately and work for the deferred tax also separately. So that is the idea generally about IAS 12. And, you know, this is waiting for you in the exam hall if you are writing financial reporting. IAS 12 is a regular customer with his brother, IAS 16. They are smiling. I can see them smiling there in the exam hall waiting for you with their teeth white and looking at you. Uh, uh, uh. So that's the idea about that. And that's how you deal with deferred tax issue. But it is important you understand the various terminologies that if the tax base of the amount exceeds the carrying value, you know that that is going to result into deductible temporary difference, right? 
deductible temporary difference because, I mean, the tax base is greater. But if the tax base is less than the carrying value, then that is going to result into taxable temporary difference. Deductible temporary difference creates deferred tax assets. Taxable temporary difference creates deferred tax liability. So you have to also understand these rules because sometimes the line will just say that, oh, the temporary difference of or the difference between the tax base and the carrying amount of the entity is, you know, 5,000 in excess of the tax base. So you have to understand the meaning of that language and explain it in this manner so you know whether it's a taxable temporary difference or a deductible temporary difference. So that's the idea about that. <laughs> Let me know if that is okay for you in the IAS 12 environment. Okay, I think I've answered that. I said, the things have become plenty in my head now. Which one is plenty? I said, thank you, sir. All right. Any other questions for me? Let's see if I can pick some questions also here. Main scene here. Let's see if I have some questions coming up on, I don't know, YouTube here. What's the name? Chuka. Unuzegluk. What is onerous contract say? Can you throw more light on it? Onerous contract is simply a one-time contract that an entity undertakes, which results into a loss. And for such contracts, in accordance with IES 37, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets, the entity can make provision for them. That's onerous contract. Abdul Adi said, thank you for educating the public. Many of us really appreciate your work. It's a pleasure. Annie, Maria, I, hey, Charlie. What's it then? Hi, Ishira. Hello. What's it then? Hi, Ishira. Please, can you increase the volume on your end? The output sound is quite low. Thank you. Really? My output sound is low. Okay. -o. I'm just joining now. Hope I'm not late. Nope. If you have any questions, you throw it in the chat for me quickly. Yes, what else do I have? Or I can start talking and get the heck out of this place. So that at this point that people have a lot of things going on in their brain. Let me leave them and go and sleep. <laughs> uh, what do I have? Ishra, what do you mean by saying for three shares in respect of share option? What's the name? Ishra, what do you mean by saying three for three shares in respect of share option? Give me a sec. I can't get that. Okay. I'll say, what do you mean? What do we mean? By saying two for three shares in respect of share options. Share options. Two for three. How? Okay. I'm gonna explain the two for three, but in share options, I don't I don't get that part. But I'm gonna just gonna explain the two for three part. Now so Two for three simply means that we give you two new shares for every three you are already having. But that share option now, they are tallied to honor. There is nothing like that. Because in share, share option is a right given to sh uh, employees or whoever the heck to uh, buy some shares in the company. So when you say two for three in respect of share options, uh, I don't know what you're talking about though, but two for three means we give you two new shares for every three you are having. So that's what I can say there in that case. Um, what do I have? Yes, Samo. Yes, Samo.
Yes, Samo. Hello, Isra. Yeah. Yeah. Please, my uh, question on my qualification is on the consolidated. Uh, we, we have the, the fair value and the proportion method. Should I, if I put, if I should put it in that way. Okay. But in calculating the good rule, I was having a question and then I was trying to develop uh, some strategy. <laughs> uh, in calculating the good rule, the uh, purchase consideration, then you add the uh, fair value of uh, NCI. After that, you deduct the net assets at acquisition. Then you get your good rule. When when you are when you are using the uh, fair value, but when when they were solving question relating to proportion method, they didn't add the NCI NCI value, the fair value of it, the NCI. So what it was like purchase consideration less at net asset at acquisition. Is it, uh, does it have a link like that? It's not net asset at acquisition. It is the parent share of the net asset of the subsidiary at acquisition. Th these are two different things. Yes. So if you are going with a proportional approach, yes, that's another way good will be calculated where we are not bringing the NCI issue in it. So you bring fair value of consideration transferred, then you less the parent proportion of the shares of the of the net asset at acquisition of the subsidiary then it gives you the goodwill at acquisition please be careful of this there's a difference between goodwill at acquisition and goodwill at the reporting date it's important you know which one the examiner wants you to calculate usually when we are preparing the consolidated profit or loss account alone then the examiner will require us to calculate goodwill at acquisition which means if there is any impairment in goodwill, men pray and go and deduct it to get a goodwill at the reporting date. If not, you just wasted time. You won't get any marks for that. So be mindful of goodwill at acquisition, goodwill at reporting date. That's very important. But yes, those two methods are applicable. The key thing is if you are doing the proportionate method, you take the parent's share of that's the percentage of the parent ownership of the subsidiary of the net asset at acquisition of the subsidiary so that's the idea about that without without with bringing the fair value of nci yeah you, you said proportionate method so everything will be about just the parent yeah. entity so the nci issue will not come in okay so so if it is fair value that's when you bring the uh, NCI value. Right. But you got to be careful about that approach sure. because we solved the question in class during the revision session, one of the questions we were solving. There are times the examiner will give us the goodwill, the uh, proportion of goodwill of NCI or goodwill attributable to the NCI in the notes. If that is the case, which we did in class and we solved that question and you, you saw it. I don't know if everybody remembered that, but we solved that question just this week. So I know you should remember. In that case, then we will get good, whatever goodwill we calculate will be goodwill in respect of just the parent. Then we have to add the goodwill attributable to the NCI so that we can get a total goodwill for the period. So... That is also another yes. excess, which we discussed in class, which I believe that everybody should remember. So that's the issue about that. Oh, oh, okay. Isha, uh, one thing I will say is, since this one is a discussion, maybe if you can unmute everybody. So when you're explaining and a question comes out, the person can come in. Yeah, you can. that's why I said you raise your hand, because I wouldn't want the uh, discussion to also be flooded. So that I can address uh, the questions as and when they come respectfully. Because if I unmute everybody and everybody is just coming in, there will be a lot of chaos. So that's why I just want that order so that 
if there is any question you have, something follow up, you raise your hand, I bring you up, or you put it in the chat for me, just for us to have that order. And yes, I bear, you know, a little yeah. bazaar. <laughs> So that is the that's the uh, reason. Uh, okay, that. because when you were explaining, when you were explaining the provision, and the question says that uh, ignore the time value of money. Yes. Uh -huh. So I wanted to ask: so would you calculate and get the present value, or and use and use the present value and ignore the finance cost? Or you just pick the the value they gave you as the uh, is the let me say the future value. They just said ignore time. Let me value come again. Money. The, the the statement is ignore time value of money. So you don't discount anything. So whatever is given to you in the question, that's what you work with. It is when we are taking okay. into consideration time value of money that we have to discount. So if we are not taking into consideration time value of money, then no discounting, no unwinding. Oh, oh okay, okay, Insha. Uh, thanks for pouring Insha on us. <laughs> you, I hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, what else do I have? Uh, let's see. Got some charts coming up. Let's see if we can pick them quickly. Oh, I said, please, can you briefly explain the tax implication under IFRS 2? Um, please, this is not for financial reporting students, so don't focus on it. Now, so the tax implication of IFRS 2, it is something the examiner has not asked yet in the last eight examination diets under IFRS 2. Okay, I'm not saying that tomorrow you will be asked in the corporate reporting exam, but I'm just saying that is something that the examiner has not been excited about. As to why he has not been excited about it, I don't know. When you get there, you ask him, he was just going to tell you. But the idea here is that we're going to look at a tax base, okay, uh, and then calculate a carrying amount. Then we will get temporary difference. But one thing you need to understand is that always... When it comes to share-based payments, the tax implication, it is always going to result into what we call deductible temporary difference. So it will always create a deferred tax asset. Does that make sense? It will always create a deferred tax asset. The treatment simply here is that for tax purposes, we say that the current amount is nil. But then we calculate the tax base of the share-based payment. It works like the same liability, but we are going to use the intrinsic value on the shares because tax will be paid on the intrinsic value of the shares. So we're going to have the number of employees or number of rights expected to vest times the number of employees times the intrinsic value, IV, times our timing ratio. That is what gives us the tax base, and then we bring it up. So technically, it tells you that the temporary difference is going to be negative. Because you have to less this, the temporary difference will be negative. That is why it always re results into a deferred tax asset. You apply the tax rate on the temporary difference, then you get your figure coming up for the period under review. But there is an exception to that. The rule simply states that where the cumulative amount of the carrying amount of the share base payment exceeds the tax base, then the excess should be recognized in equity. What does that mean? It means that although for tax purposes this is going to be our workflow, it is important that we calculate the carrying amount of the share base payment for the respective years. And you know the way we do that calculation already. Number of rights expected to vest multiplied by the number of employees, multiplied by the fair value, okay, multiplied by the timing ratio. So you're going to calculate the current amount for whatever respective year it is, and where in a specific year the current amount exceeds the tax base, it means that excess must be recognized in equity in that particular case. So that is the idea about 
the tax implication of share-based payment. Let me know if that makes sense to you. And you can, again, if you have my book, you can quickly just go to that session. The rule is there. There's a simple question there. And you can see, again, the way the workflow goes. But that is the principle. That's the principle. Let me know if that is okay for you. Then if there are any follow-up questions, you can raise your hand and bring you up. Then, uh, what else do I have? Can you touch on the makeup of lease obligation in the book of both the lessor and the lessee? Lease liability. Initial measurement. It the lessor doesn't recognize lease liability, so what are you talking about here? I don't know what you're talking about, bro. But um, for the lessee, Present value of minimum lease payment will come. Any deposits that they have made earlier will be deducted. So I could just go here and then give you the list quickly. About IFRS 16. Here we go. Oh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, so you said lease liability, okay. Okay, I'm just in the rules here. Okay, these are the indicators. Right of use, accounting for lease, recording the assets, measuring the initial measurements. Okay, so this is the, then, then we come to the lease obligation, calculation of the lease obligation. Okay, so it's gonna be making up of any amount that we're going to be having in that particular case. So present value of the minimum lease payment, okay, will come. Uh, any direct cost that they incurred to arrange the lease will come. Any reimbursement that they are getting from the lessor will be deducted. Um, if it happens that they have made any deposit to the lessor, it will also be deducted. Then if there is any guaranteed payment that they have to make to the uh, lessor, that will also be coming. So any payment that has to be made in the future to the lessor for cancellation, if they are uncertain about it, that will also be coming there. And that gives you the initial measurement for the lease obligation. But you said lease liability in the books of the lessor. The lessor doesn't recognize lease liability. The lessor recognizes, um, how do we call it? If it meets the criteria to be classified as a finance lease, the lessor recognizes lease receivable. And we solve the question about how that workings is done also in the cost of this week, if you remember. But that is the idea about that. He will also recognize, or the lessor will also recognize the present value of minimum lease payment will come, then any guarantee on the residual value of the asset will also come. And usually these are some of the things that the, uh, will come in when it comes to the lease receivable in the perspective of the lessor. Remember, for lessor accounting, we have to ask, does the lease meet the criteria to be classified as a finance lease or is, is an operating lease. Because the principle is that if it is an operating lease, then certainly the asset will be accounted for as investment property. And the annual lease rental will be received as an income in the financial statement of the entity. But if it meets the criteria, and we spoke about the list of the criteria, um, a list of the points. One, we said that if the lease agreement is taking a significant portion of the economic useful life of the asset, if there will be tran uh, title transfer, if the lessee can buy the asset at the end of the lease term at, you know, a residual amount or at an amount below the residual value, all these will meet the criteria. So when a le you are looking at lessee accounting, it's important you identify has it met 
the criteria to be classified as a capital lease. If it hasn't, then it should be IAS 40 investment property. Then just in line with that, someone is asking, how do you calculate the right of use asset? The right of use asset is just like PPE I spoke to you about. So how do you recognize the initial value of PPE? So right of use is going to be present value of minimum lease payment. I think the list is here. Let's see if I can have it for you. Yeah, this is it. So you bring in your present value of the minimum lease payment in that particular case. Then any payment that has been made already will be coming there. Any incentive that we receive will be subtracted. Any initial direct cost that was incurred will be added in. Then if there is any dismantling cost we have to incur on the lease asset, we apply IAS 37, discount it and get a present value. And that is how we get the right of use asset. Okay, that's how we get the right of use asset. So that's the initial measurement. So it just follows the IAS 16 principle, uh, technically with the exception of the first figure, which is the present value of the minimum lease payment, technically, technically. Okay. All right. So any other questions, you raise your hand, I bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. So let's run through a couple of things quickly. Number one, consolidation. I've told you that stay away from this. Let this be your last or last but one question. And the goal is for you to do workings. But if you get to the exam hall and something comes over you and you start with it, I pray for you. Because all I know is 99.9% .9 of the time, you start with this question, your chances of passing the exam is small. Very, very small. 99.9%. .9 so stay away from this. Let it be your last or last but one question. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, that was the only question I can answer. Yes, madam. Please go ahead and answer it. It's your swag. But in consolidation, there are two things we need to understand. Number one, the various theories. And then number two, the basic principles. On a theory perspective, we mentioned that there are a couple of things that we need to understand, like investment in associate, IAS 28. How do we account for that? We account for that using what we call the equity accounting. And there are indicators of significant influence. If we have a representation on the board, if we have a representation of any governing authority uh, or governing body of the entity, then we have significant influence. And in that case, by default, usually, we expect that an ownership of, you know, 25%, but less than 50% gives us significant influence. But you have to be careful because we solved the question again in the mock exam, Accra Limited and Tema Limited. If you remember, the entity had 40% ownership. But then they have the right to appoint board members, remove board members, set their remuneration, and also for someone to change that decision, they will need a two-third vote to change that decision. And the other owners we actually spread across board. So although we had just 40%, to third is actually 67%. So we mentioned that because although they had just 40%, because they appoint, they remove, they set the salaries of the people or the key management personnel, and to change that decision to third approval is required, it will be accounted for as what? consolidation. In other words, the entity that they invest in will be treated as a subsidiary. So that is something that you need to understand in that particular case. So we could have a theory coming in in IAS 28, Investment in Associates. Then we could have a question coming in from the IFRS 3 
perspective, business combination. A lot of issues are there that we need to look out for. Then IFRS 10 um, consolidated financial statement is also going to be there. Or it's also another theory area. But a couple of things. Number one, how do we obtain control or indicators of obtaining control? You know that already. You need to make sure that you go through that. However, the most important thing here will be two things. One, why will we get a bargain purchase in an acquisition process, meaning that the goodwill figure is negative? What are some of the reasons why the goodwill figure is going to be negative? It's important we understand that. Right? We said that, oh, maybe the seller is very desperate, or maybe they don't know the value of their assets, okay? Or maybe it is because we had a good negotiation skills. Then certainly, we have to know about this. Number two, if there is negative goodwill, how do we account for it? We said negative goodwill is accounted for as a gain on acquisition. So in that case, if we are preparing consolidated statement of financial position and we have a negative goodwill, then that negative goodwill will be added to the group retained earnings. It means on the face of the statement of financial position, there will not be goodwill figure there. But if we are preparing consolidated profit or loss, then that negative goodwill will be added as a line item in the consolidated statement of profit or loss. So that's the second thing that we need to understand. There could be negative goodwill. Why will that be? Number two, if there is a negative goodwill, how do we account for it? Number three, which is also like a question we discussed in, in the mock, when there is a negative goodwill, it calls for remeasurement of the assets of the subsidiary. And we discussed those various assets that can be remeasured. It's a theory area. The examiner can show that to us. And we must understand it pretty well. Then, generally, the issue about internally generated goodwill and purchase goodwill. Although that is an IAS 38 item, because goodwill is also under consolidation, it is something that the examiner can throw at us there. And you know that we only recognize purchase goodwill on the face of the financial statement or goodwill arising from business combination and not goodwill arising from an internally generated uh, assessment of the entity. So that is the issue about those theories that you, know, you want to make sure that you have them. Whatever it is, the examiner is going to be throwing at us. Five marks question is going to be coming in from the consolidation that we need to make sure we understand in that case. Then you come to the basic principle issues there. In Shira, that is for CR, right? IAS 28. Why is it for CR? Didn't you talk about investment in associate? It's a fundamental issue, Co financial reporting, corporate reporting. We spoke about investment in associates when we're, do when we're doing consolidation. So it's not for CR students. Everything I'm talking about here is for both classes. It's for both classes. Then you come to the principles. Pretty simple. Group structure. It's a default issue. You need to make sure you understand. Sometimes the examiner will give you the number of shares that we have acquired. In that case, you have to calculate the, your own percentage of acquisition, and then you can get the NCI value coming in in that regard. So it is important you understand that sometimes the percentage of acquisition will not be given. We'll just be given the number of shares acquired. So if I want the percentage of acquisition, it will be the number of shares acquired over the total equity shares of the subsidiary times 100. Then that will give us the percentage that we have acquired. Then we can conclude whether we can do a full consolidation or not in respect of the question generally for the period under review. So that is the issue about group structure. But for corporate reporting students, if we have a complex environment, that means we will have a parent, 
investing in the subsidiary, then the subsidiary also investing in a sub-subsidiary. He explained the principle here. So if, for instance, the parent owns 80% of the subsidiary, then the NCA in the subsidiary is 20%. But if the subsidiary also goes and acquires 75% of the sub-subsidiary, then the question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the NCI in the sub-subsidiary? The way we do that is to calculate the controlling interest in the sub-subsidiary. And that is the principle that any investment that the parent entity makes, the subsidiary has their share of ownership of that particular investment. So it is going to be 80 of 75, and that is going to give us an answer so that the balancing figure is going to be non-controlling interest. Now, the subsidiary controls the sub-subsidiary. It means we can do a full consolidation of the financial statement. All right? So that is the issue about group structure calculating NCI in that case. Then you come to goodwill calculation. You know the drills already. We've spoken about a number of the items. Four items can come in when it comes to calculation of the fair value of consideration transferred. Either we are paying cash, you don't need a miracle on that. If it is a deferred payment, then you have to discount it into present tense if we are taking into consideration time value of money, and we've discussed that principle as well a moment ago. If it is a contingent consideration, we may take into consideration time of value of money, which we must discount. If not, then we have to look at the remeasurement at the reporting date, and then any reduction in that deferred payment will be again to the parent entity. There could be issue of shares and there could be share exchange. The key thing is that when it comes to the share exchange, you're going to be using the parent sh share price to value that particular share exchange. So that is fair value of consideration transferred. We don't know what the heck the examiner is going to be bringing there, but it's going to be something there that we need to generally understand. That's the issue about that. There's going to be something there that we need to generally understand when it comes to dealing with the fair value of consideration transferred. Then we need a net asset. The net asset is not going to be a miracle. You just go to the statement of financial position and pick it there, acquisition at year end, and then in the notes, we will be given the amount. But I told you something, that sometimes the examiner will not give you the retained earnings at acquisition. If it is not given, you have to calculate it. And I gave you the rule that the way you calculate uh, retain earnings is to bring the opening balance and then any profit or loss for the year. If it is a profit, you add. If it is a loss, you're going to subtract. If they paid any dividend in the question, any dividend paid by the parent will be subtracted. Okay? Rarely would they do this, though, but, you know, not really. They could pay dividend. Then that will give us the closing balance. Balance brought down. It depends. And you saw the question we solved in class. I explained this to you. Okay? You, solved, you saw the question we solved during the mock discussion. I explained this to you. So the deal is just to turn this, formula, turn this format upside down. But it depends on... Is it a media acquisition or half uh, acquisition at the beginning of the year? If it is acquisition at the beginning of the year, that is very simple. You just start with a closing figure, the balance brought down, and then the dividend was subtracted. So we're going to add back the dividend. If they made a profit for the year, then what is going to be happening is that the profit of the subsidiary for the year was added so we will subtract the profit if they made a loss then it was subtracted so we'll add it up then this will give us the retain earnings at acquisition assuming the acquisition was done at the beginning of the year but if the acquisition was done midway through the year then the profit or loss for the year we have to prorate that based on the pre and post acquisition period we explained this during the mock discussion. Okay. So, 
Retain any net acquisition may not be given. That's how you calculate it. That's how you calculate it. Then, when it comes to the net assets, all you need to know about which you, you will fight in the exam will be fair value adjustment. And it will depend on the context of the question. But generally, fair value adjustment has to do with the accounting standards. IAS 16. You can have IAS 37. You can have IAS 23. Borrowing cost. You can have IAS 38. Whatever the heck. It's... It depends on how excited the examiner is. IS 16 is the default thing that will come. It was waiting for you. 37, 23, 38 depends on the context of the question. So if you understand these standards very well, boom, you're not going to have any problem with these when you're dealing with fair value adjustments. But this is my final take on this one. When it comes to the fair value adjustment, the net amount must be added to property, plant, and equipment on the consolidated statement of financial position. But you have to be careful. Sometimes the examiner will say that, or the question will say that, the fair value adjustment has been incorporated by the subsidiary at the reporting date. If they have already recorded it, then you won't come and add it again when you are preparing the consolidated financial statement. But if the question say they have not, or the question is quiet, then you can go and add it. So it's not every time that the net in the fair value of adjustment will be added to the PPE on the face of the consolidated statement of financial position. It depends on the context of the question. So you make sure that you read the print. Now the reason why net asset is very important so that you can calculate your goodwill. Because the examiner is going to be reserving, depending on the structure of the question, between three to five mark questions, uh, five marks to the goodwill calculation. Three to five. So you're able to get that, you're going to be good generally. You're going to be good. So once you get your net asset schedule well, look at how NCI is being valued, boom, boom, boom. You should be able to do the various other workings in that particular case. So that is the issue about that then i mean the various other issues intra-group trading you need to know the various things if there is provision for realized profit the sold goods it's important you understand that if you are preparing consolidated profit or loss all goods sold during the year the total sales the total post acquisition sales must be cancelled in the consolidated profit or loss. So you subtract the same figure from revenue and the same figure from cost of sales. Again, during our mock discussion, we saw this playing out. Please be careful. The key word is total post-acquisition sales. The reason I said be careful is that maybe the company, the, the, the sales they, they got control on, say, 1st July. But they had been trading among the self, themselves prior to the acquisition. So on consolidation, we don't bring out the total sales in the year. We only bring the sales that relates to the post acquisition period so again it depends on the blueprint so that is what i'm telling you let this be your last or last but one question and you are there for free marks based on the workings flow that we have explained to you so you can get some ticks if you're excited in the exam hall and you decide to start with it i pray for you because 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to fail the exam if you decide to do that. But I don't know, you know, some of you, some things will come over you in the exam hall and you will do some things. So we will still pray for you that whatever that will come over you will help you to still pass the exam. But my recommendation is stay away from this because there's a lot in here. 
So that's the idea about that. Now, to corporate reporting students, there is just something I want to talk to you about. This is to corporate reporting students. In the calculation of goodwill, in the sub-subsidiary, you remember there is a principle you need to understand. When we are doing the calculation of goodwill in the sub-subsidiary, we bring fair value of consideration transferred, but not the total amount the subsidiary paid to the sub-subsidiary. We only bring the parent share of the subsidiary of the amount paid. We solved the question and you saw the way we did the workings. That's the principle. So you got to be careful. Now, if it happens that the parent itself has a direct investment in the subsidiary and together it gives us control, then certainly you will bring the amounts that the parent paid directly as well as part of the fair value of consideration transferred. But that is an exclusive thing that you need to understand when you're dealing with sub subsidiary. You bring parents' ownership of the fair value of consideration that the subsidiary paid to the sub-subsidiary. Very important. Then, in dealing with NCI, again, this is for corporate reporting students, in dealing with non-controlling interest in the subsidiary, there is an another adjustment you have to make. Yes, you bring the fair value at acquisition. You bring their share of post-acquisition, whatever the heck, profit or loss. But their share of the fair value of consideration that the subsidiary transferred to the sub-subsidiary has now been given to the sub-subsidiary. So we will less the NCI's share of the fair value of consideration transferred by the subsidiary to the sub-subsidiary. That's the principle. So, again, that's the deal on consolidation. And, you know, the more you dive in, the more interesting it becomes, the more it looks like it's a lot, but that is consolidated financial statements. So for corporate reporting students, if it is a sub-subsidiary, you need to be mindful of the way we calculate. If it's a complex group structure, you need to be mindful of the way we calculate the goodwill in the sub-subsidiary and then NCI in the subsidiary. Very important. Because remember, goodwill, we're going to be showering a blessing on us. By the examiner, we'll be showering a blessing on us. So it's important you understand the way the workflow is very important very important so that is the idea about that and like i said intra-group trading you know the things that are going to be there so i mean no problem really there that we need to know about then i've told you also that um make sure you read through the conceptual framework oh all other things being equal, you're going to be having some questions coming in from there, especially for financial reporting students. Something about the conceptual framework is going to be smelling there for three to five marks. So it's a theory. You want to make sure that you take very well in the exam hall in that regard. Yes, Linda. Yes, Linda. Hello. Yeah. Yes, hello. Please, the NCI part in the subject. Sir, please, I'm saying that the NCI part again. The NCI part of what? In the subsidiary. The sub yes, this very one. Yeah, so we are saying that you bring the fair value of NCI at acquisition, bring their share of post-acquisition profit or loss, then you will less the NCI's share of the fair value of consideration that the subsidiary paid the sub-subsidiary. So let's say that the subsidiary paid the sub-subsidiary $100 million. And the group structure is such that the parent has 80% of the subsidiary, so NCI is 20%. What we are saying here is that 
in the calculation of goodwill in the sub subsidiary, you're going to bring 80% of the 100 million they paid. That's how you calculate the goodwill in the sub subsidiary. Then, when you come to the NCI, the remaining 20% of that 100 million will be subtracted in getting the NCI in, in the subsidiary. The reason is that that investment has now moved from the subsidiary and it's now in the sub-subsidiary. That is the meaning of that statement. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, what's the name? Please explain the intragroup trading again. There is there's a lot of things under intragroup trading. So if you, if you can tell me something specific because we have sale of goods, uh, we have reconciliation of current account, we have um, sale of assets. There's a lot there and I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I have the time to be able to do all that right now. So if there's something specific under these three things that I should talk about, then possibly that would be good. But the whole intra group trading, that, that would take me some time to do. So if there's something specific there uh, that you would want me to touch on, I can touch on uh, quickly in that particular case. Because we have sale of goods, which I spoke about. We have um, reconciliation of current accounts. And then we have the sale of assets between them. So let me know what specifically your issue will be then probably I can address that. Okay. So the final issue, like I said, is you make sure that, yes, there's going to be written or comment areas. So you pick those ones out as fast as possible, generally at the end of the day in the exam hall. But, you know, there are a lot of standards that uh, in corporate reporting and financial reporting. But I've told you there's going to be at least two of the non-current asset standards. At least two of them will be featured in the exam hall. And the non-current asset standards, we know about the various ones. IAS 16, it's the issue in re regard to that. We have IAS, you know, 40, investment property. We have IAS 37 provisions we have IAS 23 borrowing cost we have IAS 20 government grants then we can chip in this guy IFRS 5 non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation so these are the non-current assets accounting standards but as you are doing these non-current asset accounting standards there are two other standards that actually connect with them and that is IAS 12, income tax, and also IAS 36, impairment of assets. Okay? I could even chip in this guy, IAS 38, intangible assets. Like I said, for financial reporting students, you don't have any option. Whether I like it or not, IAS 12 is waiting for you. IAS 16 is waiting for you. So these two guys, they are waiting for you in the exam hall. Okay, and we have spoken about something um, in the IAS 16 with the questions that people were asking and something about IAS 37 also with uh, a question about some s that you were asking. And then IAS 12 also, we've spoken about a question that uh, somebody was, uh, someone also asked. So if there is any specific question you have in respect of any of these standards, you can raise your hand and bring you up or you throw it in the chat for me then I can uh, talk to you about it, something specific in respect of any of these standards. So non-current asset standards, we're going to be seeing them coming in in the exam hall in that particular case. Then for level three students, this is for level three students, we know are the exclusive IAS 19 employee benefit and then IFRS 2 share-based payment. These are the level three exclusive. Depending on how excited the examiner is, if he is excited, these two are going to be featured. Remember I told you it could be in the notes to the consolidated financial statement. Yeah. So as part of the notes to the consolidated financial statement, you are seeing 
IES 19 come into town or IFRS 2 come into town. But these are level 3 exclusive standards. If the examiner is excited, you're going to be seeing either one of them or all the two featured either as a dedicated question on their own in the question 2 overlapping to the question 3 or definitely we're going to be having the issue in relation to um, just one of them coming in in the consolidated financial statement. So depending on how excited the examiner is and how he would want to visit this particular area. So that's the issue about that. Then the next category of the standards are these three guys. IFRS 15, IFRS 9, IFRS 16, leases. These three standards are standards that actually work together, especially because under IFRS 16, when there is sale and lease back, we have to find out whether performance obligation is satisfied in accordance with IFRS 15. And if performance obligation is satisfied, that means that the sale and lease back is actually a sale. And so then we will just uh, derecognize the asset and recognize a lease and then apply the lessee accounting, as you know already, in IFRS 16 in that particular case. So if, yes, the criteria is met, then certainly... It means the asset has been sold, it will be derecognized, then the entity will just recognize a lease obligation in their books. But the recognition of the uh, lease right of use asset will be based on the percentage that has been transferred and then will recognize any gain or loss on the percentage that has been also the right of use will be based on the percentage that has been retained and then will recognize gain or loss on the percentage that has been transferred. If performance obligation is not met, which means we have not sold the asset, then it means it is a financial arrangement. In that case, we apply RFRS 9 because we will treat the loan, uh, the money we receive from the quote-unquote lessor as a loan and apply IFRS 9, financial liability, and then what is going to be happening is that we continue to account for the asset in our books since it is not a sale. So these three standards, you know, can work together or one of them will be in the exam hall or two of them will be in the exam hall as a dedicated question or as part of the footnotes to the financial statement. So that is also what you need to understand when it comes to dealing with these three accounting standards that also work together as well. So yes, Non-current assets, we're going to be having at least two of them. If the examiner is excited, he could just set all his questions from the non-current asset. Level 2, level 3, he doesn't care. All of them will be just non-current assets. But what is going to happen is that you will apply more than one accounting standard in a given question. That one, you are assured of it. Okay, and so that is why I always tell you, and I keep on telling you this right from the beginning, you don't learn the accounting and then you say, oh my goodness, thank God, I have finished learning IAS 40. No, you're not done. Because if you remember, IAS 40 is applicable in IFRS 16. If the lessor identifies that the uh, lease arrangement does not meet any of the criterion we discussed, then in that case, it will be treated as an investment property. So there is a connection there. Then if you are dealing with IAS 16, you cannot say you are done because there is an IAS 20 implication there. There is an IAS 23 implication there. There is an IAS 37 implication there. Then on the subsequent measurement, there is an IAS 36 implication there. Then there is an IAS 12 implication there. Oh my God, it's just nice. So it's going to be a bundle. It's going to be a package. So the five mark question, a six mark question on the accounting standard, you'll be likely to apply two or three accounting standards before you can solve the question. And the purpose is the examiner just want to know if you know. Okay? The examiner just want to know if you know. So that's the issue about the accounting standards. And definitely by now, it means that you have solid knowledge in all these accounting standards, all other things being equal, you know, because if we don't do Citeris Paribus, 
then there will be a problem there. What do I have? Highlights on IAS 20, the indirect method. Which one is IAS 20 indirect method? Which one is IAS 20 indirect method? Government grant indirect method. Which one is that? I don't know what, what, what the heck you mean by that. Maybe if you can explain that to me. I don't know what you mean by indirect method because I don't remember IAS 20 having anything like direct or indirect method and how that applies. So I don't know. Maybe you can give me something specific in that regard. I said then please highlight on diluted and in special for IAS 33. So non-current assets, level three exclusive, these three standards working together as well. Then there are other accounting standards that we spoke about, the IAS 2, IAS 10, you know, IAS 8, you know. Then the other standards, IAS 33, you know, and in special and all of those things in that particular case that you need to understand when it comes to, you know, dealing with those issues as well when it comes to that. So, um, what? Diluted and in special. We discussed this also in class. So I don't know what part of diluted and in special, but there there are two things under diluted and in special. If you want, issue of loan notes, and then maybe share options. The idea is that when there is loan notes, that we are assuming that the loan notes are converted in the beginning of the current year, although it's not due to be converted. When that happens, it means whatever tax that is payable, sorry, whatever interest that is payable, we are not going to be paying it. And then any tax benefits arising from that interest, we're not going to be enjoying that tax benefit also as well, generally. So I don't know which of these two, because these two are, again, a load of things that time will not allow me to teach but the uh, loan note we have to do an adjustment to the profit for the year so you're going to be giving profit for the year that's there then you calculate the interest on the loan then you less the tax benefit on the loan you get the interest net of tax and then you become you get your adjusted profit after tax so that becomes the numerator for your earnings per share, the adjusted profit after tax, divided by the weighted average number of equity shares. Now, the weighted average number of equity shares, it's going to be any outstanding shares the entity is having plus the number of shares in the loan notes when they convert. How many shares are they going to get? So when it comes to the loan notes, that's how you do the workflow because we are assuming that they are converting their shares now at the beginning of the year so we will not pay the interest again and then any tax benefit also we're not going to be enjoying that as well in that case during the mock just this week we discussed uh these things as well and how we are supposed to do it in share options we spoke about the fact that we need to calculate the percentage of dilution first in that regard because the profit after tax will not be changed because share option doesn't affect the profit so we're going to use the profit after tax given in the question then we calculate our percentage of dilution which is the share price minus the exercise price divided by the share price times 100 and that gives us the percentage of dilution. Then we calculate for the number of shares in the option. And so that will be the percentage of dilution you calculated in step one, multiplied by the share option. Then you can now calculate your weighted average number of equity shares, which will be your outstanding shares, plus the number of shares in the option you did in step two. So when there is a share options, in the question we are calculating diluted and in spare share, then this is how you calculate your weighted average number of equity shares. Once you have that, then your diluted earnings per share will be the 
profit of the tax given in the question because share option doesn't affect profit divided by the weighted average number of equity shares which you calculated using the three step approach here so percentage of dilution the current share price minus the exercise price divided by the share price times 100 all these will be given to you in the question you don't have to calculate them then the number of shares in the option your percentage of dilution multiplied by the share option you get a number of shares then to get your wins you bring in your total shares that you had at the beginning of the year and then you add the number of shares in the option you got then boom you get your answer there so diluted and per share that's what you do note that anytime the examiner said you should calculate diluted earnings per share you need to calculate the basic earnings per share first so that you can then get the diluted earnings per share and know the workings that you have to do there because at the end of the day we may analyze what is the percentage of dilution to help shareholders to make whatever decision that they need to make So that is the issue also about that particular area. So when it comes to the accounting standards, these are the things that we need to talk about when it comes to dealing with the accounting standards. Like I said, 25 marks waiting for you, corporate reporting students, strictly on the standards, 25. Okay, 25% of the marks, strictly on the standards. Okay, corporate reporting, financial reporting student, 40% for you guys. 40. 20 dedicated, 20 on their single entity financial statement. So the standards, 40. Okay, corporate reporting students, 25, waiting for you. Now, this is exclusive of the five mark uh, theory question of standards that the examiner will ask you or may ask you. Let me, let me not say will ask you may ask you because the examiner depending on how excited he is may ask you a five mark question in respect of written or comment question on a certain accounting standard and it could be whatever accounting standard that he's excited about IAS 24 i mean related party transaction which we discussed yesterday with the mock questions or whatever accounting standard he's excited in so that's an additional thing if the examiner so wishes to go there, then another five mark I said on consolidation. That's a standard related question. It could be IAS 28, IFRS 10, IFRS 3, or whatever the heck that the examiner wants to ask you. So that's the issue there about the accounting standard. So really, I mean, you rise or fall on the accounting standards. Usually when people fail corporate reporting or financial reporting, it's because they don't understand the accounting standards or they are not able to manage their time well in the exam hall or something else in that case. So that's the deal on the accounting standards. And so by now, I mean, all other things being equal, you should have solid base on the accounting standards. All other things being equal. Solid base. About 85 90% ish courage that hey, I got sh I got this, I can do this. I mean, these things are not a big deal, I can understand them pretty well. <laughs> That's the idea there. Then we come to the last part of the discussion, which is going to be ratios. And a couple of questions have been asked already on this one, so um uh it means that i don't have a lot to say here on the ratios but we know there's going to be ratios waiting for us in the exam hall evaluation of financial statements the deal is to know about how to do the various calculation because some of you that's the beginning of your downfall so pay attention to the context of the question don't go and be using the formula you think you have to use when the question is stating something else. So be careful about the context of the question and which formula you have to use. Especially if you look at the question that we solved during our mock uh, session, 
especially that environment. And if you look at the question we solved during our ratio discussion, that kind of thing. So make sure you understand the context of the question so you know the formula to apply. Okay, so the calculation, yes, know your general formulas, but sometimes the examiner will ask you to use certain assumptions in your calculation. Know about it. The second thing is going to be your interpretation. Please, format is important. So know the format. If it is a report, make sure your format is in a report format. That is the first thing the examiner looks at before starting to read your English. If it is a report, to, from, date, subject, intro, financial performance, financial position, conclusion. Close up, yours faithfully, sincerely yours, whatever the heck. You sign, name, boom. Format. If it is just, say, analysis, comments on the performance of the company, then boom, boom, boom. You go straight up, write your head in, and then you start. But please, I've told you this already. Your introduction is very important. This is your first impression to the examiner. So your intro, keep it sweet. Keep it sweet. Simple. Straight to the point. Very, very sweet. Straight to the point. Don't come and do... And I've told you the difference between analysis and then analysis. <laughs> There's a difference. This is singular... This is plural. So know when to use what. Don't go and write, eh, this report analysis. Don't go and write this thing. Don't go and write this thing. Be careful about that. So that is the idea about your intro. Keep it sweet, simple, straight to the point. Then... The basis for the evaluation, we've given you that. Okay? We've given you the basis for the interpretation. Follow the order. I have told you, if it is a default approach, then start with your asset turnover or the revenue movement. Then naturally come down to gross profit margin, cost of sales. Then naturally come down to net profit margin, operating expenses. Then naturally come down to rosy or ROI, which is going to be your movement in capital employed and whatever is going on. So go back, make sure you have those rules at your fingertips, but look at the question. So when you finish your calculation, sit down and brief the question, like go through the question and find out, is there something I can say that I can contextualize, that I can verify in the question so you don't lie? And I've taught you that. We've gone through the drills. We've seen the way the analysis is done. Some of you have written. Some of you never wrote anything. So I don't know your faith. But we believe that you write something sensible in the exam hall. Not we believe. I, don't, I can't say that. But we hope you write. There are two different things. We hope you write something sensible in the exam hall. But make sure you follow you know, the drills there when it comes to dealing with the ratios as well. Then suddenly the question that Clement asked me about ratio um, cash flow analysis that I uh, answered a moment ago. This has this came first in the in the last three examination diets, and that's for just corporate reporting students. Cash flow analysis is something the examiner can throw at you. You are not doing any workings; you are just doing an analysis for twenty marks or fifteen marks, and it's important that you know how to do that also well. So that is the deal also on the ratios. So like I said, my recommendation is first, as you go, you pick out all the theories or comment questions. And I've told you, do not write anything in your question paper. Nobody will chase you there. So in the 15 minutes reading times, you're going to hold your thoughts. You cannot write anything, but you're going to hold every answer you are getting in your thoughts. Don't panic. Don't think you forget. It's 15 minutes. Hold your thoughts. I mean, if you can't hold something for 15 minutes, I don't know what the heck is wrong with your brain, but you got to hold your thoughts. Then when they say start work, like I said, you can open your answer booklet, the first page, and then 
have an answer plan there so that you can write those points in the answer plan before later on you can explain them don't write them on your question paper because if you forget and you're not able to transfer them later your question paper will go to your house with you and nobody will come to your house to come and mark the answers that you wrote on your question paper but if it is in your answer plan then although you did not write it out later on you could be given some coins for having it there because you wrote it there you didn't get time to transfer it to uh, or explain it further so you could be getting maybe some one or two marks depending on the judgment of the examiner and that could push you to cross the promised land to help you to pass the examination so the structure is very important on the way you present yourself generally in that particular case so that is the issue about that you take out the theories and the comments then like i said depending on your understanding you go to the ratios depending on understanding you can then go to some of the standards generally in that regard so my take to you is this in the 15 minutes reading time what do you do you have to scan read the question and look out the written on the comments questions sometimes it's going to be spreading across in question four and question five sometimes sometimes you, there could be even a written question in question one b which is supposed to be consolidation there could be a b question in question one which will be a comment or reading so in the 15 minutes reading time all you want to do is that you s try to scan read the rating on the comment part. Then if they say start work, if I were you, don't start. Okay? Don't start. You still want to just hold yourself a little bit and try to read through all the questions well, the requirements of the questions. The idea is that when you read through the requirements of the questions, including all the standards and everything, you don't have to know, okay, oh, this standard is, is there. Okay, this requirement is this okay it is this topic okay it is this thing then you can form some understanding then you can now take time to read through well please take time to read through the questions well that's very important take time to read through the question well it's very important yes there is a trap that you may not read the questions well, but take time to read it. So make sure you allocate time very well. If you are solving a question and realize that you are spending more time than you are supposed to spend, stop it and go get something else to do. Because remember, each mark is 1.8 minutes. So you need to be able to keep yourself up generally when it comes to your timing. Then for those of you in financial rep and corporate reporting, Corporate restructuring, financial reorganization, and his brother, business valuation, one of them will be there. When it comes to the business valuation, the asset method, you know the, the formula there. You know PE ratio, and then earnings yield, and then uh, dividend yield, and then, um, yeah, generally. You know the principles. Make sure you go over them very well. If you are doing the asset method, please, this is for corporate reporting students. If you are doing the asset method, you know that assets whose recoverable amounts cannot reliably be measured will not be considered in the workflow. For that reason, what is going to happen is that if there is goodwill, we don't consider it. But remember, if there is preference shares, preference shares is a liability. Because when we are valuing businesses, we are valuing the equity. But also be careful whether the question is asking you of value per share or the value of the business. These are two different things. Value per share is different from value of the business. Depending on the context of the question, you know what you're supposed to do. PE ratio. You know that it is going to be the earnings per share times the PE ratio. And you know the P ratio will come from the proxy pen. And we said we cannot use the P ratio of a proxy pen. So we need to adjust it downward so that we can calculate the value per share. Earnings yield, dividend yield, we said also that will come from a proxy pen. 
But again, we cannot use a proxy firm's earning shield and dividend yield, so we have to adjust it upward to build into the system the equity risk premium. These are the principles you must understand. These are the principles you must understand. Then the last method is the cash flow method. Please remember, in the cash flow method, depreciation is not considered because a depreciation is a non-cash item. So if we are giving profit before tax, but depreciation has been calculated or included in arriving at that figure, then we'll go and add back the depreciation. Be careful about that. So the business valuation is just about the methods, knowing the principles, and knowing how you can derive the various things from the question. And then we have the dividend valuation method as well, how we can derive the various things from the context of the question. So on each of the methods, just make sure you understand the principles. How do we get the figure? How, how do we adjust up, adjust down? If no risk is given in the question, we said the adjustment is between 25 to what? 30%. You can adjust downward by 25 or 30 or adjust upward 25 to 30, depending on which formula you are using. If it is P-E ratio, we are adjusting down. If it is earnings yield, dividend yield, we are adjusting upward when it comes to the workflow in that particular case. So corporate reporting students, business valuation, make sure you understand these formulas well and the principles behind them. Then corporate restructuring, financial reorganization, we know what is going to be there already and we've said that whether I like it or not, we need to prepare capital reduction accounts. Please, this is also in corporate reporting alone. We need to prepare the capital reduction account and that is an account that is used to complete the double entry principle because it acts as a control account and at the end of the day, any amount of that is going to be taken to the capital surplus account on the face of the statement of financial position that we're going to prepare after the scheme is accepted and implemented. However, Sometimes the examiner could ask us to calculate the maximum loss or gain under the reconstruction. We've stated that the maximum loss or gain under the reconstruction is the same as the capital reduction account. Only that when we are doing maximum loss or gain, the balancing figure we get, we are going to be sharing it between the preference shareholders and the ordinary shareholders. It will depend on the context of the question, but usually if we are use doing maximum loss or gain, the difference is going to be shared. But if we are doing default control, uh, capital reduction accounts, then the balancing figure will be taken to capital surplus or capital reserve on the face of the statement of financial position that we're going to prepare. Then lastly, it's going to be the fact that if the company it goes into liquidation, if it goes into liquidation, we get a proceeds. Please note, if the company is going into liquidation, any cash in hand will be part of the proceeds. Please take care of that. You remember in the mock, we spoke about this and then, yeah. People did not bring the cash, although there was a cash in the statement of financial position. So if the business is going into liquidation and there is any cash or bank balance there, not bank overdraft, bank balance under current assets or cash under current assets, it will be included in arriving at the proceeds from the disposal. Then you are going to be lessing the various payments. Ultimately, if there is liquidity expenses, we're going to less that first. Then any priority payment, depending on the context of the question, we're going to be less in that. Then any fixed charge, floating charge, and all that will be subtracted as well. Then all unsecured debt will be bundled together. And then if there is some money left, we will share it on a pro rata basis. Preference shareholders, ordinary shareholders will be, you know, the last people to be paid. Preference shareholders first ordinary shareholders last. So it's important you also remember that principle as well. Between these two guys, one of them will be there, either corporate reconstruction, financial reorganization, or 
business valuation. Like I told you when I was teaching you, issues about uh, reorganization has not really been asked by the examiner. It's a pure written aspect or comment aspect. So I don't know. Maybe you can read through that tomorrow morning or something like that before the 2 p.m. as you go to the exam hall. It's just a theory area. This is where you read things like uh, business management buyout, management buy-in, spin off, sell off, carve out, and all those things. How to finance management uh, buyout, those things. Does that make sense? Those things. They are reading areas. You can read them and then go away in that particular case. So that's the idea about your syllabus and the various things that you need to understand. The last thing I will throw at you is that um, you may see a five mark question that you have no clue about. In other words, it's not that you don't have a clue about, it's just that you don't remember it anywhere. Don't beat yourself up. It's okay. Go to something else you know and write. Don't waste your time trying to recollect something if it is not coming. Okay? Don't waste your time trying to recollect something if it is not coming. So that's the idea also about that when it comes to dealing with that. Please highlight on capital, what, maintenance. I think I've already done that a moment ago. Okay, so that's the idea about that. And that's my take on how I expect you to approach. Take away the theories. Come to ratio. Then for corporate reporting students between business valuation and corporate reconstruction, you choose one. Uh, whichever comes, if you can do it, you go for it. Then you can go to the standards. Chances are... You're going to spend a lot of time, corporate reporting students, on the business valuation or financial reconstruction question. Because you know the reading. Some of you, your English is no good. So when you read it, you have to think. So be careful. Take your time and read well. All right. For financial reporting students, one place that you may be wasting time or you may spend time if you're not careful will be the single entity. We don't know what is going to be there. Either cash flow, profit or loss and OCI, whatever the heck. The standards are going to be applying. But you have to be careful because that's an area you're likely to spend a lot of time. But be careful about that. Just be careful about that. So basically, that's your syllabus and what, you know, you are supposed to do as you go into the exam hall. And we uh, hope that, I mean, you'll be able to go in there and then put some of these things into bear and then find out how you can work these out in that case. Uh, let's see, I'm getting some comments coming in from YouTube. Let's see if I can look at them if possible. What do I have? Good day. Can help? Can you help shed more light on how to treat disposal that leads to the loss of control? I think I've already spoken about that. Emanuela said, Ishira, how do we treat contingent consideration on goodwill when the target is not achieved? Huh? When a target is not achieved, it depends on what will happen. Um, it means that we will not make the payment. If it happens that the, entity, the, the parent will not make the payment at all, then it becomes a gain. The whole amount becomes a gain. And so if you are doing consolidated P&L, it will be a line item as income. If you are doing consolidated position, you will add it to the group retained earnings. But if they don't meet the target, and we, are, we were supposed to have paid 2000 but because they don't meet the, that target, we are now going to pay them 1005 then that means it has reduced by just 500. That 500 is still a gain and will be recognized in the PL account if you are doing consolidated PL or in group retained earnings if you are doing consolidated retained earnings. The deal is that once they don't meet the target, it becomes a gain to us. But the, but the issue then will be how much? Is it all the amount or 
just the difference between the amount at the date of acquisition and the amount at the reporting date. It depends on the context of the question and how you do that. Who the freak is this one? Why is it that some people act very, very, very crazy like this? How the heck do you just come and put some nonsense in my live stream like that? Give me a sec. Let me just highlight this so that my team can block this account. Okay. Please. Give me a sec. Um, that is. <coughs> hey. Check this account. And block it. Okay. That should be done. Okay, so that's it about that. Gonna wrap up here and let you lose and let you go. And we wish you all the best as you go. And hopefully you'll be able to go in there and then make yourself proud at the end of the day. And I've told you whatever it is that you need to, in addition to whatever we've discussed, I mean, take into consideration that you want to make sure that you work on your emotions well, I mean, in the exam hall, because a lot is going to happen in the exam hall in respect of um, when the question comes, when you start reading, a lot will be going through your mind, but you want to make sure that you compose yourself well, okay? And it's an exam, okay? So make sure you have some water, with you so that i mean if you are becoming very anxious you sip some water and you'll be good i'll plead with you do not get any ideas to engage in any examination more practices do not get any idea to engage in any examination more practices when you are caught you will be disgraced it's an exam if you are not prepared go and sit down Nobody asks you to register for the exam. Go and sit down. But if you think you are prepared, go in there, do what you can, stay out of trouble. But please make sure that you look at and pay attention to everything that we have discussed, everything that we have gone through. By now, I believe that what you are going to be doing is just cruising. There's no pressure. If by now you are still under pressure, I've not learned this, I've not learned this, I've not learned this, then there's going to be a lot of panicking going into the exam tomorrow. So by now, all other things being equal, you should have relaxed your nerves and you're just cruising. Okay, uh, this standard. Okay, let me look at it again. Okay, this ra the ratios. Let me look at it again. You know, by now you're just cruising. You're just cruising. All other things being equal to reduce panic and anxiety. But if it is now you are really left with a lot of things to do, I don't know. We will pray for you. Everything will be fine. So that's it about that. Wish you all the best. Go in there. Make yourself proud. And do what you can in that particular case. Like I said, if there is anything, you can send me a message on WhatsApp or whatever the heck. Corporate financial reporting students by close of 8 a.m. tomorrow. Okay? You're in the exam hall. Don't get any ideas. I won't pick. And if you try anything... The IC will hear about you. Copy reporting students by 1 p.m. I mean, you should be able to, if there is anything before 1 p.m. tomorrow, you can reach out and then I'll be able to assist you specifically on what you're doing in that particular case. My final thing is that it's all about the principles. Okay? It's all about the principles. If you are strong in the principles, you will be okay. By now... Don't go in there and uh, or don't try to look at, hey, 
Charlie, this question, oh, hey, Charlie, this question, hey, Jesus Christ, I thought I've learned this, you know, look at this question. No, like, you, you will kill yourself, okay? So by now, like, get familiar with the principles. Really, really get familiar with the principles. And don't go, I, I'm not saying don't solve questions, but get the principles, Get a principle. So really, if I were you, like I told you last week uh, in the course of the week, like you just want to just cruise. So you sit down, you pick the standard. Okay, you go through your notes, the various things we discussed. Understand the principles. IAS 23, understand the principle. IAS 40, understand the principles. Because in the exam hall, you are applying principles. The questions you are solving you will not get that in the exam hall. You will not get anything like that in the exam hall. Y but you are going to be applying the principle if that standard comes, if that question is asked. So the goal is understand the principles. If you understand the principles very well, no matter the question, you can solve it. So reduce that emotional pressure that you may be facing because... At this point, you may pick a question and look at a question and be like, what the heck is this? And then you'll be like, oh, I've not learned anything. Get yourself well. Understand the principles very well. That's all. And it should be good. Okay? It should be good. So, that's it. Good night. Sleep well. You heard me. Sleep well. Tomorrow morning, take a quality breakfast and have a chauffeur take you to the exam center. Just treat yourself like a king or a queen for mental stability tomorrow for the exam. Okay? It's needed. All right? It's not only you that is broke. We know you are broke by taking a taxi or Uber to the exam center Paying 50 Ghana or 70 Ghana will not kill you. Treat yourself well. So they don't come and jump from one throttle to another. Hey, you are sweating. Hey, hey, hey. No, no, no. You know, that's it. Uh, what am I having? I'm seeing some comments in the chat. Christina, thank you. Clement said, intimidation. <laughs> oh, come on. I can't intimidate you. All right, so that's it about that. We end here. And uh, all the best. And... Uh, Tuesday, uh, what do we have on Tuesday? Let's see. What do we have on Tuesday? Tuesday is, uh, what do I have? Tuesday is MAN Advanced Audit. So tomorrow evening 10, hey, yo, tomorrow evening 7 p.m., we're going to be meeting to, you know, have dialogue on MA and then uh, AAA, depending on, I mean, the people who will be available to join and what areas I'm going to be focusing on. And then we just have a dialogue as well on that as well. So tomorrow, 7 p.m., uh, if you're writing advanced audit and assurance or management accounting, you can join the class. And if there are any questions or something that I have to share my thought on, then I help you with so that you can go on Tuesday as well and then do well. All right, so good night. Sleep well. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Please. And God sleep. bless you. Amen. Please sleep. Yo. The sleeping is not coming, oh. Sure. How is the <laughs> sleeping not coming? It's not coming. No, you are just deciding not to sleep. Some of you have drink. You've been drinking coffee and things and trying to mix incubation and things and be drinking concussions and be drinking sleep relax <laughs> just enter the shower open the tap let it just you know flow like that then you just stand there the tap is just pouring on you like that like five at this point the, the cold water is becoming warm <laughs> So that's it about that. Uh, all the best, and I'll catch you on 
tomorrow after your class in that case i want to see if that i have anything on youtube that i need to handle okay i think that's all so au revoir like i said i'm gonna be on standby if there's anything you hit me up on whatsapp or in that regard and then if i have to have you on a call then uh we go on a call but you know largely i'm gonna be available so that's it about that does that mean i will not sleep <laughs> i'm actually going to be working so i'll be on standby if there is anything you can link up bye bye catch you tomorrow all the best au revoir monsieur